Mission Street. Finnegan, and if you're as big a fan of Coronation Street as I've always been, you're in for a treat. In the next hour, we're taking a nostalgic walk down the street, past and present, and reliving some of its greatest moments. We'll be meeting the street's most evil man, some of its strongest women, and springing a surprise get-together, where else but in the rover's return. And just to get us all in the mood, do you remember these three ladies? I suppose it never occurred to you to get one in for me, did it? Well, we're only just having the one, Nina. Aye, it's nearly time for concert. Is it? What are you going as? Razzle Dazzle Girl. Just or even this unlikely time, trio. You will be mine when it apples. Oh, right. It apples blossom time. And back in the very early days of the street, the wedding that was. <laughs> All right. Or the wedding that wasn't. Hello. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, classic Coronation Street. That's what tonight's all about. A chance to relive some memorable moments from 31 years of the street. And there's over 3,000 episodes to choose from. Well, the residents of Coronation Street, past and present, are faces known to millions of us. But the houses they've lived in are another matter. Every house has a history and every doorway tells a story. The house we're going to look at now is a place which over the years, believe it or not, has been a home to all these people. to have guessed it, I bet you have. It's number 13, and it's the house which saw the street's first death, its first bathroom instead of just a toilet in the backyard, and was for many years home to the street's most famous married couple. The very first residents we met there were feuding mother and daughter May and Christine Hardman. Will you not say everything in such a moaning voice? What are you flaring up for? Well, you're always the same, moan, moan, moan. All I said was there's some sort of a stole, it'd be better. And all I said was we hadn't got one. But you didn't say it like that. You used a different voice. It was the way you said it. Oh, you don't just have to mind what you say, but how you say it. <laughs> well, just three weeks after we met her, May Hardman died of a brain tumour. <sighs> Daughter Christine never fully recovered. In fact, she had a nervous breakdown, but she went on to find happiness two years later when she eloped with Colin Appleby. Next over the threshold were newlyweds Myra and Jerry Booth, for whom 13 proved to be an unlucky number. This book's got an oat in it. For the first time in my life. Well, the money just seemed to get spent before and I could put this? it in. What's this? Receive with thanks, Frank Barlow, 20 pounds. 20 pounds? Are you giving 25? Uh, and that's another thing. Now, where did you get the £25 from to pay Frank Barlow? Now, you didn't get it out of a savings book because they've been out in that book for weeks. Your dad wants Your dad? He didn't mind. Look, I just asked him. So we owe him money and all. Well, I thought you'd rather owe it to him and to Mr Barlow. Well, I don't want to owe it to anybody. And I don't want your father thinking I can't earn enough to keep you either. Uh, and why does this receipt only say £20? Myra, I I'm talking to you. Now, why does this receipt only say £20? You had £25 in that drawer yesterday morning. Well, 
<laughs> you mean to tell me we still owe Frank Barlow five pounds? Yeah. Well, what's happened to it? Daddy, you Murder. Have to be sorry. What's happened to that other five pounds? Put it down as a deposit on our summer holiday. Summer holiday? Summer holiday? I do remember those tough times for the Booths. Myra and Jerry were 60s favourites, brilliantly played by Susan Jameson and Graham Haberfield. Money problems, marriage problems, it was moving stuff that touched millions of hearts. The next residents to move into number 13 were determined to avoid their share of bad luck in rather an ingenious way. Well, what do you think? Well, what do I think, what? The door! Well, they. Oh, aren't they smart? Where did you get them? Woolies. They had black ones, but I thought you'd rather have rust. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're very nice, then. Very nice indeed, Jack. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Pulling yeah. me other trousers. Haven't you got yours? What, in my pinny pocket? Don't talk to that. Back door open. With our luck, what do you think? <sighs> well, Stanley? It's another fine mess you've got me into. <laughs> yes, of course, it could only be the Ogdens. Hilda and Stan brought number 13 from the booths for £575 in 1964 and were to spend 23 years there, along with a lodger or two. In fact, 11 lodgers in all, and that's not counting the three ducks. By the time Hilda and Stan had settled in, it wasn't just bad luck to live in number 13, it was pretty bad luck to live next door. Come have me dinner in peace. Uh, did you say something? Oh, never mind. All right, where is she? Did you do that? Did you just switch that wireless off? Well, he didn't switch himself off, Hilda. This is my home, Mrs. Yes, Allen. and that is my next door. I repeat, this is my home, and as far as I know, nobody's invited you into it, have they, Stanley? Oh, no, Joe. No, no, right, no, so no, will no. you kindly leave before I forget I'm a lady and do you a serious injury? Oh, I, you and how many flaming others, Hilda? Just me, that's all. Just me. All right, come on and try it. Come on, I'm right. waiting. I'm oh, waiting. back in, in that pair of you, will you? Come on, Hilda, I'm waiting. Elsie. Look, it's nothing to do with you, Len. Nothing to and do nobody with... Nobody invited you in here, either. I told you, nothing to do with you, and I'm still waiting, Hilda. This is my house, and I'm having my dinner. And I'll have it in peace and quiet without two flaming women shouting around me head. Well said, Stanley. Remember lodger Eddie Yates? What's that? This is a breakthrough in modern technology, this is. What is it? How many times have I heard you say that you wish you could see your small screen favourites in living colour? Many a time. What's it got to do with that thing? Very good, Mrs. O. Stay to the heart of the matter as per usual. This converts your black and white telly into colour viewing right here in your own home. Yeah, well, that's where we generally do us viewing, right here in us own home. Sure, now. Let him show us. Look, for a mere fraction of the cost, I attach this device on the telly like so. Here we are. Hey, presto. Colour television. <laughs> that's never colour telly. Hey, it's blue at the top and green at the bottom. <laughs> All right for football and racing, eh? Yeah, what did I say, Stanley? Good as gold. It's rubbish. It's just a nasty bit of plastic with a bit of colour job done. Job John? Job? Hilda, that is put on scientific. Look, a colour telly costs 250 quid. That costs a mere fraction, a couple of quid. I don't care, it's no flaming good. Yeah, but it's very reasonable for the price. All right, yeah. Oh, Luke, I don't care if it only costs two pence. It's no good and I'm not having it. Oh, give over. It's better than nout. Ooh, story of my life is that. Better than nout. <laughs> Poor old Stan. He hardly ever ate his dinner in peace. Trip came down, somebody shouted Geronimo. Oh, look at the mess. I told you that chimney wanted sweeping. It doesn't need sweeping now. Look at me, look at the mess. Look at my dinner. Never mind your dinner. Look at me, Muriel. <laughs> my man 
Manson's turned into a slaggy. The absolutely hilarious Stan and Hilda. We were all really sorry to see them go, but sadly Hilda left Coronation Street on Boxing Day 1987 and moved to Derbyshire. And number 13 was taken over by two of her former lodgers. The current residents are, of course, Kevin and Sally Webster. Please welcome Michael Lavelle and Sally Whitaker. Well, that Muriel had to go, didn't it, Sally? Well, it did, but to be honest, Judy, we loved it so much, we put it in Rosie's bedroom. <laughs> Do I believe this? <laughs> Actually, I have to say that dismantling, it would have been like dismantling a shrine, really. Well, it would. It was so loved. How could you get rid of it? Absolutely. How did you both feel about getting a house in Coronation Street? You must have felt quite chuffed, to put it mildly. Well, you could do nothing but really, could you? I mean, it is part of the, the British history. You know, and just to say, I've lived on Coronation Street, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people can say that. No, especially in Stan and Hilda's old house. Exactly, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean they were uh, an institution in their own right, them two, you Absolutely. know, and I'm, I mean, I'm just honoured. Something else you are is extremely absent-minded. You're missing somebody, a particularly small person, in fact, a baby Rosie. Mind you, it's not the first time you've lost her, is it? You've mislaid this baby. No, I knew you'd bring that up. No, it's not the first time I left her behind, you know, and, and the last time it was, uh, it got me in a lot of trouble. But we've got a responsible babysitter tonight. So she's safe tonight, is she? She is. Emily's looking after her. Let's have a look at last time you mislaid her. <laughs> look, it was a mistake. Anyone could have made it. Martin put the wrong baby in our pram. All I did was take the pram. And I didn't take a close look because I didn't want to wake her up. Or wake him up. Either of them up. I mean, what do you want me to do? Apologise for the rest of my life. No, just next time, make sure you've got the right baby. Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do next time. I'll ask you for identification, you know, driving licence, credit card, that sort of thing. Most people wouldn't need to do that, Kevin. Yeah, well, that's where I'm different. Go into the pub. Fine. Oh, and if I uh, don't come home, you know I've gone to the wrong house, don't you, eh? Because you know what I'm like. Yeah, I do. You certainly so much to tell her when she's older, won't it, eh? What are we going to do with your dad here? Do you think we can swap him? 